Okay. Yeah. Yep. So just your name and your sort of uh, title of the description. Uh, sure. Uh, Alexander Tamas. I run a small investment firm where we invest in a lot of frontier technology things, and my background is in technology in general. So I've invested in some of the leading technology platforms across the globe. Uh, and obviously you're one of the uh, early investors in Facebook and Twitter and uh, some of these big social media platforms now. Um, I was wondering, when you, back when you first invested in these, what kind of impact did you expect that these technologies were going to have on society? Um, I think it was very clear very early on that the impact could be massive mm -hmm. uh, overall, um, both in terms of how we interact with each other and how we interact with politics, government, uh, and overall in society. Uh, the amount of sharing, so initially, before Facebook, I was with a company called MailRU in Russia. Um, and Russia was really leading in terms of adopting social networks because they came very early at the time of when the internet penetration was still low. And the amount of engagement we saw was incredible. Um, people sharing stories, interacting with each other and so forth. And we thought what we were doing in our small little pond of Russian speakers, Facebook was doing on a global basis. Um, and that could be incredibly powerful. I had. One particular example, which I thought was really interesting, this was probably 2008 or 2009, there's a song of the year for the Christmas period in the UK. Mm -hmm. And somebody thought it'd be really funny if they took uh, a song from Rage Against the Machine to make it the official Christmas song of the year, and they did it on Facebook. And so many people started supporting it that, uh, and people actually had to go and physically buy this. This was not just online voting, people had to physically go and spend money. Uh, and that song from Rage Against the Machine became the Christmas song of the year. Um, and when I looked at that, I thought the power of these platforms is incredible. Um, and that was one of the reasons why I thought it's going to have a big impact on uh, humanity and could be a really interesting company as well. And uh, we invested very heavily in 2009. And you were expecting mostly positive impacts? Or were, did you have any early concerns? Um, less early concerns. I thought the impact was going to be such that you give more voice to people and uh, people will be heard more uh, overall. Uh, because the distance between government and people, that's nothing new. That has happened now for a really long period of time. And all of a sudden you gave people a forum where they could go and voice their concerns and uh, talk and discuss with each other rather than being drip-fed certain propaganda by governments. And I thought that actually be a really positive and it could potentially cause uproar in especially authoritative regimes where people have controlled the media very tightly. Um, and I thought Facebook could have a really meaningful impact in, in changing that. Mm. And looking today, kind of how does the how does what's actually happened kind of compare to what you expected? Um, I think we see both. I think we see the power of the platform of giving people a voice, um, and I think that is a very positive thing that people can actually express themselves. I think we also see that people can organize themselves for good causes, um, which has been empower, incredibly impactful. But we've also seen that people can find other people they otherwise could not have found so easily. Um, that have more extreme views um, and make those more extreme views seem more normal. Um, and as a result, you have basically both the really strong positive impacts and the pretty negative impacts as well. Um, and that's why I think many people are upset right now with it. Um, and I think as humans, we tend to focus on the negative before the positive. Um, and, and certainly there are issues that have to be sorted out um, to make sure that the platform is more used for good than for bad. Mm -hmm. Interesting. So do you think at the moment there are kind of positive uh, outcomes uh, for politics that aren't being highlighted enough or that you know, we should be talking about more? Um, yeah, you, you saw the uh, Arab Spring, you saw uh, how social media transformed things like Al Jazeera, for example, uh, when reporting was incredibly difficult and uh, them focusing on making social media core and center of having all of a sudden sort of two camera people, thousands of camera people that were sending sources. Um, that was incredibly positive and impactful. Um, and we see, uh, I think, quite a lot of that overall, whereby we're highlighting things that otherwise would not be highlighted. If beforehand you had a camera team in a region, and whatever the camera team chose to focus on, that was the narrative that people believed in, uh, and what people thought was important. And now we have eyes everywhere, and ears everywhere, and I think that is overall a big net positive, because we're, those false narratives are not so easily um, spread by governments. Now we have different false, Stories and that get promoted over these platforms, but that's that's a different issue. Interesting. And we could obviously talk about this much longer, but I want to switch gears a little bit, just to be mindful of our time. Uh, today in the session, you raised this uh, notion of a digital manifestation uh, of ourselves and how we have technology to make that possible. Could you just describe a little bit more about what you mean by that, and also why you, how you think that might transform 
democracy. Yeah, I think that's actually going to be a really important thing. So we have new technology available, which for the first time allow us to get to a single state of truth that we all agree on in a decentralized way. Um, so people don't need to know each other and we can agree on a single state of truth. And in the past, what we had to do is we had to have a custodian of trust in the middle. That custodian of trust was this really big platform. And as, as a result, these really big platforms became incredibly powerful. Um, now we can take those platforms out of the equation and still operate in such a way that we can get to the single state of truth. Um, and we're just exploring the beginnings of it. So we obviously, people are talking about Bitcoin and Ethereum and so forth, but I think the ramifications are going to be much broader. And one of them is that just like you have a physical body, you will have, you can have a digital manifestation of yourself that is not reliant on a company controlling it, but that is in a decentralized way confirmed as true, accurate, unalterable, not hackable. Uh, so this can be essentially something we can trust to be you just like your body is you. Um, and what we can do with that, that, that can be really powerful. So think about democracy. In democracy, right now, people are frustrated. And part of the reason why they're frustrated is because the distance between where decision making happens and what people want and what they do is growing larger and larger and larger. People have no idea what's happening, for example, in Brussels and, and so forth. And that frustration causes people to not even bother to vote, take no interest, or go to pretty extreme ends mm -hmm. because they're upset with the status quo. So, one idea, for example, could be if you have a digital manifestation of yourself, you could use that to express your desires and interests. Not in a way whereby you have to be deeply engaged and learn and study and become a political scientist, but we have our desires that um, are intuitively clear to us. So, for example, if I were to ask you to force rank 20 attributes about society um, that you care about, and you rank number one, let's say, um, healthcare or to environment, three, job growth, or uh, unemployment, uh, four, education, whatever it is. You, you, you put out your ranks. Behind all of these various things, you have KPIs that you can monitor and understand you know, how well society is doing. If I have that from you, and I have that from everybody else in society, I can get the utility function of society at that moment in time. You don't need to wait four years to have a new election. You can change your opinion tomorrow. If you get mucked on the street tonight, you know, you'll go tomorrow and say, well, you know, it looks like we do need to watch out for crime. And, Police is important, and so you may want to rank that higher. And so you have a real-time responsive feedback towards the issues where society stands. Mm -hmm. um, and I think that it could be a really interesting tool initially for humans to make decisions. Um, and then over time, you can have machines that can help to optimize and help humans get to better decisions. Um, because for the first time, you can actually quantify these things. Uh, similarly, a discussion that, that you and I had, there are things that, you, that are typically incredibly difficult to quantify. Um, social issues, how people feel, how connected they feel to a community and so forth. Um, well, you could ask people. You can ask people in the digital manifestation um, uh, certain questions. You know, the question could be, do you, are you optimistic about the next five years compared to, uh, to where you are today? Mm -hmm. And you can monitor that over time in an aggregate way for all of society and it becomes transparent to people where we stand. Um, and then you get real-time feedback for a government, are we doing a good job? Are people getting more optimistic about the future or not? Um, and pre until now, this was just not possible. Mm. So to help me understand, again, the, the, this notion a bit better, so can you see, a, as you say, in the intermediate, that this could be, these digital manifestations can help people to make decisions. So are we envisaging a scenario where politicians in Brussels say, when an issue comes up for vote or there's proposed legislation, they have access to these digital manifestations of their electorate. Mm -hmm. And they're able to say, okay, what do the people I represent actually believe about these mm -hmm. things? So they would have that almost with them in the, in the parliament. Uh, exactly. Um, getting to you physically every day and asking a question is incredibly difficult, so that's hard to do. Um, Reading, for example, your body vitals every day remotely is incredibly difficult as well. Um, and so that's why we say, okay, well, elect somebody that you kind of trust and they do something maybe eventually down the road that is in your interest uh, as a proxy for you. But you do have your core beliefs. And if you can express them and your digital representation is queryable, so you can ask them digital representation at any given moment in time, where is it where you stand, you can aggregate this into your utility function. And the way I'm thinking about it is you would take a smaller country first. Um, and um, start implementing this so you just understand on the broader basis where people stand. And so when politicians get together and debate things, you know how important is it for the population, for example, education versus uh, military spending versus environmental spending. And we are still in a world of scarce resources, although some of our politicians 
act as if we were not in terms of spending, but we have scarce resources and we need to decide how do we deploy them. And scarce resources is also our time. What do we debate about? Um, and if there's something that is really on people's mind, then that is something that you know, politicians should probably take up. If you then go one step further, you look into um, macro trading hedge funds. Uh, many of them are using a tremendous amount of data that comes in to make decisions entirely non-human basis. Trades are done by machines and uh, they end up performing really well. So I think there can be recommendations for machines to assist humans to understand the complexity of goals that sometimes amplify each other and sometimes negate each other and it's a very complex thing for humans to understand. Mm -hmm. So if you have a decision support system that can be developed on actual hard data and KPIs that you can measure over time, it may end up to a better decision making and people feel that they have more say in it um, and they're more empowered without having to understand all nuances. And I think that's a much better approach than direct democracy because in direct democracy the problem is that many people don't even understand the first order effect of what they're voting for, let alone the second order effects. And I think it'll be uh, very ambitious to have everybody get informed enough to actually make a vote. That's the whole point while we're electing people, it's just that the people are sometimes not delivering on the promises. Mm -hmm. One thing I would like, just one more thing, uh, try not to overlap with mm -hmm, mm -hmm, his, his speech because it can be an issue for the AD. Mm -hmm. Check on it. Thank you. <coughs> one thing I was uh, wondering about is someone brought up today that one of the functions that MPs and politicians have is that this function of persuading the electorate and of informing, perhaps. Mm -hmm. so, would that be possible in this model of having a digital manifestation? Will there be a feedback mechanism whereby the digital manifestation receives information also from their representatives and is able to take that back to you? Uh, of course, and I think in a much broader sense. Mm -hmm. um, it's not just that your MP is trying to influence you. Um, if you have visibility into the current um, utility function of society, you can go as a grassroots movement and say, uh, people seem to be uninformed about how critical our environment is for us, for example, right? Let's start a campaign to inform people that this should be higher on our priority list compared to other objectives. And so you're going to have movements that will promote certain objectives versus, versus others. Um, and I think that actually has far more civil engagement and far more opportunity for movements of that sort to uh, get society to change their mind to a certain extent, um, rather than having to wait for one person of authority to, to preach. There was one uh, other uh, set of issues I wanted to ask you about, you know, changing track a little bit again, and it's this idea of business models. Mm -hmm. And we talked today about the fact that the algorithms that currently drive the business models of platforms like Facebook are really driven by uh, clicks, attention, essentially. Mm -hmm. uh, but that this could be changed. Uh, there could be an algorithm that uh, optimizes for high quality deliberation, for example. Um, if we had some parameters of what we mean by that. So, for example, we could monitor the responses that a post gets and look for, are people um, linking to sources? Are they engaging with the, meaningfully with the content? Do we see evidence of people changing their minds, these kinds of measures? Mm -hmm. it seems like that would be possible. Um, first, your take on that, is it possible? And second, if that were possible, is there some kind of, can you imagine a business model um, that would allow something like that to thrive and be successful? Overall, it's not easy to implement um, because it's a little bit of a prisoner's dilemma. People who uh, go and implement changes which are not maximizing for retention and are not ex maximizing for engagement um, will fall behind to it compared to people that do. Um, and so it is not as easy as saying, you know, why are you not m more of a company that foregoes profit and instead does these things. Um, the way right now almost all companies that are in this area operate is to see what can we do to get more users to sign up, um, to have users really engaged and to spend more time with us. That is really what you're optimizing for. Right? Um, and so, and it's natural that you know if you were to run a business this is what you would be doing as well. Um, and that's the goal that people essentially get as whether they're successful or not when they're working on growth teams, for example. Um, and you need to find out what, get pe what gets people engaged, right? And um, you're, you're not really necessarily, what you're doing is really you're holding up a little bit of a mirror to society and saying, you know, this is where society is right now, this is what they care about, and this is what they want to debate about. And you want to um, 
get content to the front that can be controversial, right? Because that gets engagement and so forth. Um, not entirely sure that this is, by the way, uh, necessarily a bad thing um, to have controversial content being discussed. Um, I think the idea of being over-optimized and as a result feeling that your particular worldview is the only worldview and everybody else shares it, that has inherent dangers. And so the discussion is to be had, what can we do for people to see more content? But to say, well, you know, we we'll forego this and instead we focus on things which are really high quality and, and so forth, you just lose audience of somebody who doesn't do that. Um, and, you know, this would have to be a global thing because companies can sit wherever they want to sit. Um, so I think it's going to be very difficult to actually implement. It's a nice thought, but very difficult to implement. Mm -hmm. And given those constraints, does that mean that there are just hard limits to what social media platforms can do as, in terms of performing democratic functions? Can they ever be sources of uh, deliberation? Um, they can be. Um, you know, another company where I'm currently invested in, for example, is Reddit, um, whereby you have communities which are moderated by people that take that community seriously. And you will find different kinds of communities, and some of them have uh, an amazing amount of dialogue amongst people. Um, and it's very different than if you go into the common section of our social media sites, which oftentimes is the bottom pit of humanity. If you want to lose faith in humanity, that's where you go. Uh, here you go and you have a really interesting discussion between people. People get new insights. People will start agreeing or disagreeing with each other, and you have real discourse. So I think it, it is fundamentally possible. Um, what I think is misguided is the idea that our social media platforms should govern what we can and cannot see. Um, I think where some of the European countries are going, Germany, for example, with huge fines in case you promote, promote hate speech, um, I think unless things are black and white, uh, absolutely black and white, so for example, a call to violence, right? That is black, that gets uh, deleted, banned, whatever. Right? If somebody says something that people don't agree with, um, that, you know, I don't think the social media platform should have the decision as to what is seen and what is not seen. Um, that is up to the German government or the French government or the English government uh, to decide what the rules are that people agree to impose on themselves. Um, and it should not be the rules of a Silicon Valley company to decide what Germans get to see or not to see and how you define things that are gray zonish. So I think in this area, um, it would actually be dangerous to give the gray zone to a private corporation. Um, It'll be much better to say, here are very, very explicit things that you cannot do, and I think we need to be careful with what we put all on that list. Great. Is there anything else you want to add based on what we've talked about? Or not? <laughs> yeah, well, you know, one thing I think that we need to be aware of, and it's, it is a difficult one to source, but an interesting discussion we had this morning um, is about how in politics, the problem is oftentimes with expectation settings. Um, I find that in, in almost all facets of life, you're really careful of setting wrong expectations. And I think you can only get disappointed in life if you have wrong expectations. So in, in my business world, whenever we look, for example, at an investment, we spend a lot of time thinking about what could go wrong. Right? And it's not just a, uh, so an intellectual fun game. It's one where we say, OK, in case things go wrong, we understand this can happen, and we're prepared for it, and we're not going to get frustrated by it because it's just how life goes. Um, and in, you do this in almost every field except in politics and democracy because you need to get elected, you start over-promising. And everybody goes in with these crazy expectations of what all is going to come. Um, and it would be much better if people were to understand that we are always in slightly troubled waters and people are trying their best to get us out of troubled waters and we should celebrate successes rather than uh, expect successes. Um, and I think that's the big difference between where movements are. You know, if you start a movement, every single thing which you achieve becomes this reinforcing success story and you think we can do more and we can do more. And that's why movements can become very popular and uh, energizing, whereas the democratic process and uh, elections and so forth can become very frustrating. And if you see what people are saying uh, uh, with democracy, it's not a current issue. This has been around for a really long time and I think this is very systemic. So the question around expectation setting and how we can get people uh, level set in terms of where we are, I think it's really important and that questions a little bit the re-election cycles and, and so forth, which, which lead to this over-promising. Great. And uh, I think we'll leave it there. Excellent. Thank you.